Welcome back fellow Plants vs Zombies enthusiasts. In the wake of the hugely controversial Plants vs Zombies 3 soft launch, I thought it a great time to bury my head in the sand, literally, and continue playing Plants vs Zombies 2. Today we resume our quest to beat the whole game with only pea shooter plants. This is the third and final episode of the challenge, so we'll be peeing in the final three worlds. Jurassic Marsh, Hell, and Modern Day. Take a seat and get ready, because this is going to get really, really tough. Make sure you watch till the end as well, because I'll be revealing the final result of the challenge. Just how much of Plants vs Zombies 2 was possible with only pea shooter. Also, I should probably remind you to watch the previous episodes if you haven't already, or at the very least episode 1, just so you can get acquainted with the rules, blah blah blah, let's get started right now. For our first world today, we enter Jurassic Marsh, the world that proves zombies somehow predate humans by 65 million years. I wonder how they survived out there with no human brains to eat. They, they must have eaten dinosaur brains or resorted to my personal favourite method of cuisine. Anyway, the first seven levels were all either primal pea spam or conveyor levels with no issues. The dinosaurs become a lot less of a threat when you have horizontal trampoline shooter to bounce them back. The zombie tug of war dynamic between primal pea and the dinosaurs in this world makes for some pretty fun levels. On day 8, I had a break from Plants vs Zombies 2 and hopped on Lawnmowers vs Zombies 2. Day 9 was a given plants level. Yes, for the people at the back, I'm allowed to skip these, as well as conveyors and other levels that don't let us choose our own plants. Day 10 saw a difficulty spike that required us to summon Goopy Shooter. Goopy is a good choice for this world since it gets rid of hostile heads and bucket heads by piercing through their armor with poison. However, it doesn't do so well against pterodactyls, forcing us to dig it up every time a pterodactyl drops off a zombie. Using this strategy, we won without too many issues. Day 11 was much the same, but with more dependency on lawnmowers. So you know how I said our strategy relies on digging up our Goopies? Well, this is what Day 12 tells us. As we entered the level I was bracing for the worst, but it turns out that only one pterodactyl spawns throughout the whole level. Easy. Day 13 was another brain dead level with Goopy. We didn't even lose any lawnmowers. At this point I started thinking of ways I could tone down our Goopy usage, which I'll get to in just a second. This guy is just too OP. Day 14 was a given plants level and we got to do one of the most satisfying things you can do in the whole game. We had a slight mishap in day 15 due to a pterodactyl, but Splippy clutched up as always. This was followed by the Gargantua fight before day 17, where Goopy carried again. Starting from now, I decided that we would only use Goopy when absolutely necessary and all else fails. This rule will also be followed in Big Wave Beach in modern day. Well, believe it or not, Goopy was already necessary in Day 18 since this level introduces a new dinosaur, T-Rex. T-Rexes speed up zombies significantly in their lane. Our only ways of slowing them down are Snoopy and Goopy, but Snoopy doesn't have the amount of damage output to handle the tanky bullies and fossil heads, so Goopy it is. Even with Goopy, this level was painful to say the least. I eventually resorted to memorizing where and when every T-Rex spawns so we could more strategically and sparingly place our Goopies. These T-Rexes are going to be a serious issue here on out. In Day 19's conveyor level, our setup was probably more secure than Area 51. Day 20 was a produced sun level with nothing out of the ordinary. In Day 21, the dinosaurs decided to troll us and spawn in all the lanes where we lost lawnmowers already. The newly introduced bully zombies are a slight problem for our Goopies since they're natty, unlike the Bucketheads and Fossilheads. We won after a couple of attempts. Day 20 22 was the last stand level where the lawnmowers recreated the extinction of the Neanderthals. In day 23 I learned that the T-Rex's roar turns backwards zombies around. Isn't it funny how no matter how many times you've beaten the game, you still learn something new each time. Day 24 was another simple job for our one column of goopies and lawnmowers. Seriously, how did this plant get past playtesting? Ankylosauruses were introduced in day 25 and they're super annoying. How is this meant to be fair? We hit a major roadblock with this level. I tried using Split P after the zombies got yeeted, but then Split P would just get penetrated on both sides anyway. I then experienced some next level wizardry when an Ankylosaurus allowed this bully zombie to phase through the lawnmower. Add supernatural powers to the list of unfair abilities this thing has. We eventually made it to the final wave, but since as I explained before the bully zombies are on steroids, the goopy shooters couldn't kill them in time. They don't really look like the receiving type either, so Splippy couldn't do enough damage to them from behind. No matter how much I tried, I just couldn't shake this level. Unfortunately, that means this is the first level I couldn't beat in Jurassic Marsh. Day 26 was actually such a troll. Every time I tried to plant something, it got flung off the lawn. Yeah, so the mold colony ends on the tile where the Ankylosaurus shoots a zombie. So every time an Ankylosaurus flings a zombie, the pea shooter in that lane gets sent into orbit. To fix this issue, I memorized which lanes the Ankylosauruses spawned in so I could plant my goo pea shooters one tile to the right so they didn't get instantly sent to space. 
And they get eaten by the push zombies anyway. When I finally got on a promising run, a stray zombie decided to beat Usain Bolt's time in the 100 meter sprint. But it was okay because we managed to barely salvage four of our mowers to the last wave in the next run, so we only had to defend the bottom lane which had no ankylosauruses. This level was only possible despite the mold colonies because they didn't spam ankylosauruses in every lane like day 25. Day 27 was another last stand level and it had a bunch of pterodactyls and ankylosauruses. This sounds bad on paper, but the strategy was to literally just keep the zombies in the very first tile with a primal piece set up to make sure they were never in the sight of the dinosaurs. Day 28 was surprisingly easy compared to the last few levels. We just had to be swift with goopy placements, plant food usage, and find a way of digging. You know, the usual. Day 29 was a given plants level. Day 30 brought a whole new issue for our goopy shooters. Gargantuas. And I thought bullies were on steroids. Yeah, our goopies do basically no damage to these guys. But then I remembered that primal peas could stall them indefinitely. Despite the annoying bullies who are immune to primal peas knockback and aren't vulnerable to goopies poison, we managed to clear the level after a few attempts. As is typical, we had zero lawnmowers to spare though. Day 31 was a locked and loaded level, and day 32 was the Zomboss fight, marking the end of Jurassic Marsh. I know I say this about a lot of worlds, but I'm pleasantly surprised with how much of this world turned out to be possible. 31 out of 32 levels to be exact. But the same will probably not be said about our next world, so let's find out. This is the world all of you were warning me about the most apart from Dark Ages. Why? Well, you can't pee in the pool. Casual Plants vs Zombies 1 reference. Seriously though, we have no lily pads. I thought about letting lily pads slide, but no. I care about the integrity of my YouTube content revolving around cartoon plants attacking cartoon zombies in a video game world too much for that to happen. Also, in this world I'll only use Goopy where absolutely necessary. In Jurassic Marsh we kind of had to use him because of the T-Rexes, but from here on out, he'll be on the bench for when we next need him. In day 1 we used Primal P to breeze through the level. If you see flying zombies over the water, it's because of a weird visual glitch that happens when they get knocked back as they're emerging from the water. In day 2, I mixed things up a little bit with just a regular pea shooter and a peas mint, which surprisingly worked. Day 3 was a conveyor level featuring our favourite plant, followed by day 4, which was another level possible with just reg pea shooter. Day 5 was another conveyor, then came day 6, which introduced our first zombie obstacle of the world, Snorkel Zombie. As you could probably guess, they're really tricky for our straight shooting pea shooters to handle. We basically had to use our other pea shooters as meat shields to stall them out when they came out of the water. Other than that, we continued our pea shooter and appeasement streak, but the fact that the tide only gave us two columns meant the ending was really close. But this was nothing compared to day 7, where we had zero columns of land. This was our first completely submerged level. Even though we don't have any lily pads, we can use plant food on the pre-planted lily pads to generate more. I tried using reg pea shooter again, but it didn't work. At all. So I tried primal pea and that didn't go too well either. So I finally opened the Pandora's box that is goo pea shooter and that didn't even work. I really thought this level would be impossible, thus starting the wave of impossible big wave beach levels, mostly because we still had no way to deal with the snorkel zombies. If only we could use a plant like walnut to force the snorkelers to come out of the water. Wait, Peanut finally makes his debut. Previously we had to use lily pads and pea shooters to tank for snorkelers so they would pop up from the water and get hit by a peas. But that costed a lot of sun and was just terrible in general since the snorkelers would only be vulnerable for a few seconds. However, the snorkelers are forced to pop up and be vulnerable for a long time as they chew the peanut, long enough for our goo pea shooters to shut them down efficiently. The only difficulty was finding enough lily pads to fit a goo pea and peanut in every lane which we could do by giving plant food to lily pads in adjacent lanes. Day 8 was a war not bowling at home level, day 9 saw a huge step up in difficulty. Due to our limited sun combined with the fast pacing of the level, it was hard to justify using peanut in every lane. This is a problem because, well, snorkel zombies. Then I remembered sling pea. It should be able to hit snorkelers since it's a lobbing plant, right? Well, for whatever reason, sling pea can't actually target them. I don't know if that was intentional or an oversight by the developers, but it is what it is. I also tried Reg Pea Shooter and Peanut, but due to all the bucket heads, Goopy is just an absolute necessity. I went back to square one with Goopy and Peanut. To get around some lanes being vulnerable, I used Split Pea to hit stray zombies that made it to the moss columns. This strategy got us to the final wave, but we still lost. After a couple more hours of trying the strategy, we got to a run where things were playing out as usual. A couple of lanes had snorkelers and coneheads that passed onto the moss, but our appeasement was about to reload. So I dug up everything for sun, placed a split pea in both lanes, and the rest was history. 
That was really relieving since this level was on the verge of being impossible. Day 10 was a conveyor level. Day 11 really showcased how even outside of snorkel zombies, Peanut is actually kind of good in this world in general since it pairs well with Goopy. The Peanuts can hold off the low tide spawns and tanky zombies letting the Goopies whittle them down. Isn't it funny how challenges like these can make the most irrelevant plants useful? Day 12 was another example of this. These levels also introduced surfer zombies who are just annoying since they block our peas with their surfboards. Day 13 was a produced sun level. Usually that's all I say for these levels and move on, but this level is really trippy. Not only did we have to produce sun, but we're also given only one line of lily pads on a map completely engulfed in water. So I used a strategy where I planted twin sunflowers on all the lily pads and, as other zombies came along, I dug them up and replanted them for goopies or peanuts. Using plant food I made some extra lily pads to protect our only couple of remaining twin sunflowers which would produce sun for the rest of the level. To bypass the limited space we have to work with I also attached some pea vines to effectively fit two plants on one lily pad. Meeting the sun goal wasn't that bad because we only had to get 2000 sun. Day 14 was a locked and loaded level. Day 15 was this endangered plants level. Notice anything? That's right, no lily pads, so we can't protect the potato mines at all. I tried to beat this level a few times, but the surfer zombies were being really annoying, so I threw primal pea shooter in to knock them back and away from the potato mines. Luckily the tide doesn't go all the way to the shore for most of the level, so we can actually put peanuts in front of the potato mines for a while. The last hurdle was the final wave where the low tide put zombies ridiculously close to the... The last hurdle was the final wave where the low tide put zombies ridiculously close to the potato mines. However, I used some quick plant food, appeasement, and peanut reflexes to keep the zombies at bay. Day 16 was a conveyor level. Thank god for that. Day 17 introduced octo zombies. Luckily, only a few showed up, but you can see why they're such a problem. Firstly, we don't have lily pads, so when the octopi take up a land tile, it's really detrimental. And secondly, the octopi block heaps of our peas due to their very high health. Day 18 was a conveyor which was lucky for me because imagine having to play this without lily pads. Day 19 was straightforward with Goopy and Peanut. I was trying to do the digging up strat against this Octo Zombie but it had 1000 IQ I swear. It outsmarted me the first time because I didn't know lily pads could also be octopused and the second time it just straight up outplayed me. From day 20 the Octo Zombie started to become a massive problem simply because there were way more of them. On top of that we only had a whopping one column of land to work with. I tried electric pea shooter since its peas could travel through octopi and surfboards. That didn't really work out though. I then tried Fire Pea purely for his plant food ability. By using Mo Launch on the first Octo Zombie, placing Fire Peas and using plant food on them for subsequent Octo Zombies, and using the Shovel Strat to block Octopi from spawning throughout the level, I managed to do a lot better. On my first attempt in doing this we got to the final wave, but this strategy was far from perfect, forcing us to waste a lot of sun. It took a lot of attempts to get the digging up timing since a lot of the octo zombies throw an octopus like 5 milliseconds after entering the screen, giving you no time to shovel up the plant. After getting nowhere from hours of attempts, I dropped fire pea and thought of alternative ways to overpower the hordes of zombies. I gave pea vine a chance since it can squeeze in on the same tile as another pea shooter, giving us a compact setup to make use of our one column of land. Surprisingly, this strategy was a good alternative to Goopy Shooter as damage wasn't really a problem because it gives appeasement the effect of a Doom Shroom from Plants vs Zombies 1. And here's how the duo handled the Gargantua at the end of the level. Yeah, Peavine deserves a raise. We won even though I allowed some Octopi to slip simply due to how much damage these guys do and how cheap they are. Day 21 was yet another conveyor, the calm before the storm as Day 22 introduced Fisherman Zombie. As is typical with levels that introduce new zombies, this level wasn't that bad because they go easy on us. Octo Zombie is still by far the worst of the two since it can instantly destroy our pea shooters and leave behind Trump's border wall in the form of unassuming seafood, while Fisherman just kind of moves stuff around. But as I said earlier, this was just Fisherman's debut level, he gets used in far more devious ways later on. Another thing to note about Fisherman Zombies is that they can now reel in lily pads too, but only when they're on water. I don't know why they changed this, but that's a slight nerf to him, so I'm not going to complain. Okay, take back everything I said about Fisherman. In day 23, the very next level, the devious fishing activities begin. The problem is that you have to worry about both Octo Zombies and Fisherman Zombies hiding behind the other zombies. Octo Zombie walks way slower than the rest and Fisherman sits at the back, so you can only really deal with them via the three endangered banana launches, which isn't enough at all. So you end up having to either let Octopi slide or let your bananas slide. After about five attempts, I got on this really close run, but this happened. I'm not gonna lie, that loss made me really salty. 
I can see why people hate these fishermen. After some more grinding, I managed to get on an equally promising run, and what do you know, the exact same thing was about to happen. I swear, if I ever come across this one fisherman, things aren't gonna end well for him. But just as its hook was about to land on the banana launcher, something completely unthinkable happened. Octo Zombie actually saved my life. Octo Zombie of all zombies. Octopi can't be hooked, which is kind of ironic since sea creatures can't be fished but mutated plants can. This caused the fisherman's hook to phase through the now entangled banana launcher and grab the goopy shooter. This is probably going to be another one of those levels I upload to the second channel, which is where I put bonus content and other random stuff. I've been using it to upload full levels in this challenge that are so tough that they deserve to be seen in full. Day 24 was Walnut Bowling at Home Part 2. Day 25 started out like an actual nightmare. There's so many Octo Zombies and Fishermen that it's basically impossible to get anything down on a lawn. We had to use all 5 of our lawn mowers just to get to the second last wave, not even the final wave, just for like 10 more Fishermen, Octo Zombies and even Gargantuas to start spawning. No matter which strategy we tried, this level just wasn't budging. If you guys want to try this one for yourselves, be my guest. Who knows, maybe one of you will be able to do it, but I definitely can't. Honestly, I was surprised and impressed that this was the first impossible level in Big Wave Beach though. Who would have thought that without lily pads or sunflowers, we would make it to day 20 25 in Big Wave Beach with just pea shooter variants. That's actually crazy. Day 26 was a very welcome conveyor level. On the other hand, Day 27's lawn made me want to pea shoot myself. Surely it can't get war. We can only use two plants. Yeah, so Big Wave Beach has these levels where it's mostly given plants. This is a kind of a grey area in our rules because given plants levels can be skipped, but are these given plants levels? I'm not going to count them as given plants levels personally by virtue of the fact that I usually only use a couple of pea shooters per level anyway. Either way, I think the writing on the wall for this one. Just like day 25, we can only make it about three quarters through the level before everything just went to crap. This is made worse by Octo Zombies, since we can't even do the shovel strat to stop the octopi because of the lily pads beneath, which we can't dig up for obvious reasons. After seeing this when booting up day 28, I instantly had Vietnam flashbacks. I'm pretty sure this is that one level that everyone hates, and rightfully so. Hell, I even remembered how bad it was just by looking at one sentence. Losing less than five plants with a zombie lineup like this? is just unfair. But hey, at least we have more than two seed slots this time. But it doesn't really matter though, because I'm pretty certain this one is impossible. You know how it says don't lose five plants? Well, it really means don't lose three plants, because lily pads count as plants too. And did I mention how basically every zombie in this world deletes your plants? Day 29 was a last stand level. Despite being severely handicapped once again by the non-existent shoreline and lack of lily pads, we managed to spend all of our sun by cramming a three peter and pea vine on every lily pad. This was a pretty deadly combo, especially especially with a peas mint, which caused absolute carnage that the UN probably wouldn't approve of. After three impossible levels, it was nice to have a straightforward level like that. My sanity was very grateful. But day 30 threw all of that out the window. It was like day 28 on steroids. I could yap all day telling you how this was impossible, so instead I'll just show you. <laughs> And that's Big Wave Beach done, since, as usual, the last couple of levels of the world are skippable. Namely, Day 31 since it's locked and loaded, and Day 32 since it's a Zomboss conveyor fight. I'm glad this world is over. Subscribe if you hate Octo Zombie. Like I did for the other worlds, I'll see how long I can go without Goopy before the withdrawal symptoms become too much. In Day 21, we found yet another use for Split P in this challenge, that being portals. Placing a sneaky split pea behind a portal can stack up damage on common portal threats including mechs and barrel rollers. Apart from that, Reg Pea Shooter did the job. Day 2 did not wait to taunt us with the world we were just tortured in. This one was surprisingly tough for so early on. Not even pea vine could help us, or primal pea. I ended up opting for snow pea since it could freeze a lot of the Egyptian threats in this level like explorers and camels. Of course on the final wave the gargantua spawned in the one lane we didn't have a mower in. Also side note, I did not know modern day already had gargantua was in the second level. That is absurd. But it wasn't a problem because our snow peas froze him while he got absolutely annihilated by pea vine boosted split peas. Day 3 was a conveyor as per. Day 4 and 5 were oddly easier than the first two levels. Primal pea dealt with them nicely. Day 6 was a produced sun level. It also reintroduces some of our old friends from dark ages like Jester and Wizard. That forced us to summon Electric Pea Shooter who made the level quite doable while also flaring up my Dark Ages Day 5 PTSD. Day 7 is a level straight from hell. Look at this lawn. You have Octo Zombies, you have Jesters, you have Breakdancers pushing Gargantuas. Whoever designed this level committed a crime against humanity. 
I tried using P-Vine and P-Shooter. I thought we were going fine until a bunch of Octo Zombies spawned on the final wave and wiped the whole lawn clean of plants. I made a mental note to save my P's mint for the final wave next time. After a whole afternoon of grinding, I eventually managed to find the right appeasement timings to ensure I had one on the final wave. When I did this, we got this extremely close run. All I had to do was place that split pea not even a second earlier, but instead I moved my mouse like I was in a vegetative state so I had to do the whole level again. But after I switched off cripple mode, we won. Day 8 was a Bagul level and Day 9 was locked and loaded level. Day 10 brought out all of the threats from Frostbite Caves and Far Future. Hunter zombies forced us to use fire pea while shield zombies and football mechs necessitated fire pea's plant food ability too. The level had an equally chaotic finish where we used all 5 lawn mowers, had to dig up every plant on the lawn fixture sign and then hope that we could place enough split peas to kill the gargantua prime in time. I hate that that rhymed. Things were not looking great, but the split peas just defeated it in time. Day 11 was quite simple. Place fire peas throughout the level and use plant foods for mechs and newspapers, then on the final wave dig up all the fire peas and spam primal peas in any lanes where lawn mowers were lost. There was a prospector and football mech in the bottom lane, so I placed a peanut at the back to hold off the prospector while the primal peas trapped the mech until it was defeated. Day 12 contained dragon imps, excavator zombies, and parasol zombies. This meant that we couldn't use fire pea, primal pea, or most of our other pea shooters for that matter. Our only pea shooter who could hit all three of these zombies was electric pea shooter. Thankfully, due to how busted this plan is we beat the level first try. Day 13 was another Bagul level, followed by another locked and loaded level. We initially tried day 15 with Primal P, but the abundance of imp cannons and prospectors made them useless. Instead, I switched to a strategy with Snow P, which worked out really well. This was partially down to how lucky I got with the freezing projectiles. This Snow P shot like four of them in a row, right on the zombies, eating one of the endangered Primal Walnuts. Without that kind of luck, that walnut would have definitely been eaten. The last wave was obliterated by the appeasement boosted P vines. I don't even know what makes P vines do a essentially infinite damage when boosted by appeasement. Maybe you could explain that in the comments, but I mean, I'm not complaining about it. Day 16 was a gargantua conveyor level and day 17 was pretty simple with 5p. Day 18 was a little tougher due to balloon zombies and bull zombies, but primal p and p vine shredded the level, especially the final wave due to appeasement. Day 19 was a conveyor level where I finally got to try out the invincible escape route glitch all of you were telling me about in the best and worst premium plants video, which you should totally watch by the way. It was pretty funny seeing all the zombies stacking on the one escape route and being stuck forever. Also, at the end of the level we finally got to get sweet revenge on the stupid octo zombies. Day 20 was another pretty basic level with primal p and p vine, but we only just survived with all our lawnmowers used up. Day 21 introduced all stars, who we basically have to use reg p shooters as sacrifices for since they're the cheapest of our plants. The level was going okay until the final wave where a bunch of portals spawn. Which caught me off guard because portals are so underused in this world that I'd forgotten they even existed to begin with. Even with our stronger plants such as Peavine, the constant barrage of balloons, portals, football zombies was making this one look bleak. The same thing would happen in every attempt. Blow on my lawn mowers, then pay the consequences in the final wave. But what caused us to lose mowers? Most of the time it was tanky threats like newspaper zombie and football zombie. At this point I had a pretty crazy idea. What about snap pee? I mean, it stops football zombies dead in their tracks without needing to sacrifice a pee shooter as cannon fodder. It also gets rid of newspapers before they enter method tweaking mode. Surprisingly on our first attempt with snap pee, we managed to make it well into the final wave, where we narrowly lost to a balloon zombie. You see, that's the problem here. Snap pee can't borrow balloons since they're in the air. So we have to mostly rely on split peas or lawnmowers to deal with them. I never noticed how Snap Peas plant food ability is actually pretty good. As you can see in this clip, it basically cleared the whole lawn of newspapers and footballs. Clearly the strategy was working, but my geriatric reaction times returned every time we got to the final wave when I had to play split peas quickly for this one balloon zombie. However, after about 10 tries, I managed to clutch up and place enough split peas to just get the pesky mongrel. This level was yet another example of how this challenge has exposed me personally to plants I would have never used otherwise. Day 22 was another Bagul level, which was oddly the easiest one so far. In day 23, I decided to give Snap Pea another shot, and he did really well again, until a snorkeler just straight up walked through him. Unlike any other plant apparently, he becomes invisible rather than invincible during his plant food ability. This level turned out to be like day 21, but with gargantuas at the end of the level. Even reaching the last wave was a challenge in itself because of the octo zombies. There were some glimmers of hope though, such as this run where we got to the final wave and took out all the zombies except one gargantua. I used some quick thinking to place a snow pea to freeze it, hoping for our appeasement to reload so we could power up our split peas but we were just seconds too late. After hours of attempting this level and losing to these two deep sea gargantuas in the final wave, an eerily similar situation to Wolfie's big wave beach day 16 experience. I just, I have no answer for these gargantuas. <laughs> these two again! I decided to just rethink my strategy. 
I went with pea vines on their own because every time I got an appeasement, it just deleted the whole screen of zombies. Sure enough, on the first try I beat the level, and as you can see this combo solved any and all gargantua issues. Then I let Snap Pea eat the leftover seafood. Sorry Snap Pea, but I think you've had your 15 minutes of fame. Day 24 was fairly straightforward and uneventful, as was the following conveyor level. As for day 26, the early and middle stages were okay, but as is common with these modern day levels, the final wave was absolute torture. So many discotrons. Roll the death montage. <laughs> Eventually I got on a really promising run, bar the fact that Gargantua lived. If all else, this proved to me that after a day of grinding this level, it might be possible. After some deep thinking, I realized I'm never beating this level unless I save the lawnmowers for the final wave. So after some good snow pea freezing RNG and perfected appeasement and pea vine timings, I managed to salvage most of the lawnmowers. But most importantly, I saved a mower in both lanes that Gargantua spawn on in the final wave. Level complete. This was definitely the hardest level modern day has thrown at us, and yet still no goopy used. Can we beat the rest of the world without goopy too? Let's find out. Day 27 was the last Begooled level. I really liked these levels. They almost serve as rest breaks from the chaos that is modern day, while also being neat throwbacks to the first game. Day 28 was a produced sun level, so we used Snoopy to slow the zombies down so we could build up sun safely. After day 26, I was surprised to beat day 29 on the first attempt with the same strategy. I honestly felt bad for this gargantua, that did not look like a painless death. Day 30 was like Popcat playing some kind of cruel joke. This is not okay. Unless they add Exodia P to Plants vs Zombies 2, there is no way this level is possible. And in a very anticlimactic fashion, Day 31 was super easy. The only threat was Jester Zombie, who Split P took care of. Although this level wasn't a very strong finish, I like that we got to end on the return of Split P who is by far my favourite PG to use in this challenge. The next three levels were all the conveyor zomboss fights, marking the end of this challenge. This also means that we got through the whole of modern day without Goopy, which is something I'll be sure to bring up in my next job interview. Something I also found pretty interesting is that your poll votes predicted the difficulty and possibility of the levels for each of the worlds in this video pretty well. Before I announce the final results of this challenge, I just want to quickly say something I don't get to say enough, which is just thank you. Thank you guys so much for all the support on all my videos in this series as well. Part 1 already has a quarter of a million views, which is just amazing. If you want to see more challenge videos like this, drop a like on this video. We're also about to hit 40,000 subscribers, which is just insane. I have a lot of bangers cooking up right now, so subscribe to make sure you don't miss them. With that out of the way, the results are in. For all the worlds up to Dark Ages, all of the levels were completely possible. In Dark Ages, 15 out of 20 levels were possible. For Neon Mixtape Tour, all 32 levels were possible. Jurassic Marsh had one in possible level leaving 31 out of 32, while Big Wave Beach had 28 out of 32 levels possible because of 4 impossible levels. And Modern Day had 1 impossible level, totaling the 33 out of 34 possible levels. This totals to 11 impossible levels across the whole game, which is an average of about 1 per world, amounting to a final result of drumroll please. 301 out of 312 levels possible, or 96% of the game. I'll definitely take that. <laughs>